Good morning. If you'll stand and take your hymnals and turn to number 56, To God Be the Glory. <laughs>
we will affirm our faith together as we recite the Apostles' Creed in unison. This historic and beautiful creed says, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sent it from the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated if you do so before we this time of prayer. some things in our lives that are plain old bad and maybe even evil. We come, Father, and we confess these to you. We confess them freely because we know that your grace is sufficient and that your forgiveness and justice will, will restore us unto you so that we can truly worship you in truth and spirit, but so that we can become more and more and more like Jesus. And that's what we want this day, Father. That's what we want every day of our lives, to be conformed to the very image of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we are conformed in his image, Father, we realize that our prayer life is not just about us and our wants and our needs, our desires, but it's about the legitimate needs of others. It's about those who are sick and those who are hurting and those who are battling injustice. It's about those who are grieving. It's about those who are struggling, whatever that struggle may be. So, Father, we lift up all the hurting across our country today. That's untold millions of hurting. Not all marching, not all on the news. Some even gathered here this day. Untold millions of hurting. So we ask that you send your comforter into our lives in such a way that our hurt is eased, that our lives become reflective of who Christ is and who we are in him, and that we are able to be all that you've called us to be. For it's in your holy name I ask these things. And now if you would, please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our invitation to give generously this morning, and again, the ushers will not be passing the plates. If you've not already done so, the plates are in the front and the back of the sanctuary. But our invitation to give generously comes from Proverbs chapter 11, verses 24 through 26, where Solomon writes, Sometimes you can become rich by being generous or poor by being greedy. 
generosity will be rewarded. Give a cup of water and you will receive a cup of water in return. Charge too much for grain and you will be cursed. Sell it at a fair price and you will be praised. So y'all need to pray for your hearing.
yet again. And we're thankful for the goodness that you pour into our lives, how you generously supply our needs, how you are indeed Jehovah Jireh, God our provider. We come, Father, and we want to dedicate the gifts that have been given both this day and this week through the mail. We want to dedicate them to you, to your service, to your honor, to your glory. And we want to thank you for the generosity that you have poured into the lives of these your people here at First Covenant. Father, it is an amazing thing to watch how you touch our lives and you open us up to be givers. We thank you for that. And we pray that you bless each and every one and that you take these gifts and use them to accomplish all you'd have this congregation to do. In your holy, glorious, and gracious name, I do pray. Amen. You may be seated. This is what we're going to come and do. Children, as we begin, we ask the kids to read in your seat. what his name is? Frog. <laughs> Not your original, but Frog. And I'm going to do a little experiment with Frog this morning, okay? Just a little experiment. All right, here's Frog. Now, if I just gently drop him, where's he going to land? He's going to land right here on the floor. Well, what, what if I hold him way up high? I hold him way up high and I just gently drop him. Where's he going to land? Oh, right on the floor. Well, let me ask you a question. Um, if I drop him, will he, will he ever land on the ceiling? No. How about on the wall? No. No, he won't land on the wall either. Because, I bet you know why, but there is a force called gravity that always pulls things down here on this earth. It's a very dependable force. Gravity says, I pull things down. That is what I do. Now, I will tell you, that gravity's a little different in outer space. My husband reminded me of that last night. But I told him that we live here on this earth, and I wanted to tell y'all about someone who is dependable on this earth, in outer space, on other planets. It doesn't matter where. Now, who would that be? Jesus. Jesus is Jesus the Son, and I'm going to talk about God the Father. God. God is totally dependable all the time. That means God is faithful. What he says is what he means. He means what he says. That's what we find in Scripture, what he says in Scripture revealed to us through the Holy Spirit. It's true. God is who he says he is, and he does what he says he's going to do. Always. He is faithful. And do you know what? There's some Scripture that tell us about that. Now, you're going to hear Pastor Mike read a little more scriptures today, but I know he's going to use this verse. This is 2 Timothy 2.13. It reads, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. 
God cannot deny himself. Whoops. He remains faithful. God cannot deny himself. So, God cannot deny himself. He is who he is. He is who he says he is. And he can't act in a way that is different from what he tells us in Scripture. Now, you know, I had this little animal. I had this little stuffed animal. This little stuffed animal sits on my bookshelf at home, and it kind of looks at me while I'm sitting at my desk. Now, I said his name is Frog. How do you spell Frog? F R O G. Right. So let me tell you what it stands for. F, fully, R, rely, O, on, G, God. Fully rely on God. And this little frog who looks at me while I'm at my desk reminds me to fully rely on God because He is faithful. He can't be unfaithful because his characteristic is totally faithful. Fully rely on God. He's faithful. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you are always faithful. Thank you that you are always dependent. Thank you that you are that kind of God who can't even be unfaithful. Thank you for telling us, and thank you for being only faithful to us. I pray you keep us faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now if you'll stand to take your hymnals and turn to 486, Covey Sinners, Poor and Needy.
Sunday was Trinity Sunday on the church calendar, but I ignored that to focus on the resurrection of Jesus on our first Sunday back together. But with the doctrine of the Trinity in mind and the triune nature of God in particular, I want to state that it is my belief that what Scripture reveals about the character of God the Son is equally applicable to the character of God the Father and the character of God the Holy Spirit and vice versa. What Scripture says about one, it says about all. Back when I was in ninth grade, that's some 714 years ago, best I can calculate it. But back when I was in ninth grade, someone asked me if God could create a rock so big that he could not pick it up. Now ponder that just for a second. Can God create a rock? If God can do anything, can he create a rock so big that he cannot pick it up? Now, at 13 years of age, I was unwilling to concede that there was anything that God could not do. That is no longer true. In fact, I will readily confess that there are several things that God cannot do. Now, before you label me a heretic, let me give you an example of what God cannot do. Are you ready? God cannot lie. Did you know that? God cannot lie. In John chapter 4, verse 6, Jesus said that he is the way and the truth and the life. If Jesus could lie, then he could not be the truth. Understand? God cannot lie. With that all said, please rise and embody your spirit in honor of God's word, recorded in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Rebecca has already referred to this, this passage. But in this passage, writing to his young protege about Jesus, the Apostle Paul penned these inspired words. <coughs> the saying is true. If we have died with him, and again this is Jesus, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. God cannot deny himself. The word of God for the people of God. Let's pray again. Lord, we come before you yet again, and we ask you to speak to us. Speak to us in a way that is, is plain and clear. Speak to us in a way that touches our hearts. Speak to us in a way that allows us to be conformed into the very image of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. Speak to us in a way that we learn more about you, your character, your nature. Speak to us this day, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I do not know about you, but I receive a lot of comfort from the Apostle Paul's assurance that the triune God cannot deny who he is. I love the way the Apostle James expressed the same notion when he wrote, There is nothing deceitful in God, nothing two-faced, nothing fickle. Among other things, this means that since the Bible says that God is truth, we just talked about, he cannot tell a lie. It also means that since God is just, he cannot act unjustly. Since God is holy, he cannot commit an unholy act. Since God is slow to anger, he cannot fly off the handle in an uncontrollable rage. Since God shows no partiality, he cannot refuse his grace to anyone who repents of his or her sins, regardless of their race, ethnicity, gender, educational level, or economic status. Regardless of those things, God responds with grace when one seeks forgiveness and salvation. As surprising as it may seem, the list of things that God cannot do is almost endless because he cannot act out of character. Now that's a key phrase. God cannot act out of character. I won't speak for anyone else here in this room, but that is not true for me. You see, I can act 
have character, at least what I think my character is. Most of the time, I am kind. But I can and do act unkindly on occasion. I know that surprises you. Most of the time, I can control my emotions. But I can lose control and become angry from time to time. These two examples of me not always being true to my character, at least I hope they do, help you understand just how comforting it is for us to know that God cannot deny himself. God is always true who he is. With the premise established that God cannot deny himself, let's examine the character or nature of God. When attempting to describe the nature of God, theologians like to use big words. Often these words begin with the prefix omni. Words like omniscient, which is having complete knowledge, and omnipotent, which is having unlimited power, and omnipresent, which is being present everywhere at the same time. These are great words, but they do little for the average person seeking to know who God is, seeking to grasp hold of the nature of God. And by the way, the very best we can do is scratch the surface when it comes to understanding God's nature. Because it is simply impossible for finite creatures like ourselves to fully comprehend our infinite creator. Years ago, when she was about three or four years old, our middle daughter Jennifer sang a song. And one of the phrases of this song, I think I've probably shared this before, but if you try to put God in a box, how big would that box have to be? We can't do it, can we? But here's the reality. We all try. We all try to put God in a box. But our infinite minds cannot grasp the full nature of an infinite with that in mind, I want us to focus on just a few of the characteristics of God that will hopefully help us trust Him more. That's, that's my goal, my aim this morning, to help us in these troubled times, and they are troubled times, to help us trust God more. For it's in trusting God more that we can find peace in our own lives. It's in trusting God more that we can handle uncertain circumstances. It's in trusting God more that we can progress and become more and more and more like Jesus. So my goal this morning in sharing this is to help us trust God more. Last Sunday, when we get it back for the first time, I had a cough once in this entire pandemic. I got up here in the pulpit and I talked about six times. I thought everybody would think I'm sick. And that's back this morning. I ain't talked all week. It's back this morning. There's a frog. I don't know who she is. There's a frog somewhere in this garden. My frog. There she is. <clears throat> Thank you for breaking the frog. <coughs> let's, let's look at some, some of the characteristics of the nature of God. First of all, God is a creator. Not only is God a creator, he is the creator of all things. Referring to Christ, the Apostle John tells us that through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Some people are tinkerers by nature. They just love to take things apart and learn more about how they operate. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be a lawnmower. It can be an appliance. It can, it can be a, a microphone. They just like to take it apart particularly if something's wrong, and see if they can't fix it. They are a tinker by nature. Other people are inventors by nature. They see a need and immediately set out to design and build something to meet that need. In like manner, it is in his nature for God to create things, to create things. The Bible begins with these familiar words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The very first thing, now catch this, the very first thing 
that the Bible reveals it to us about God is his creative nature. That God's creativity is not limited to the physical realm as he desires to recreate every person who puts his or her faith in the redeeming work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. To this end, the Apostle Paul wrote these words, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. By his nature, God is a creator. Therefore, he constantly creates and recreates things. At the culmination of the world as we know it, this portion of God's character will be on full display. Because in his vision of the future, the Apostle John tells us that he saw a new heaven and a new earth. God cannot stop creating. The heavens are still expanding, the book of Isaiah tells us. And now modern science confirms God cannot stop creating, and he cannot stop recreating or redeeming fallen sinful people, because to do so would be to deny who he is. God is not an indifferent creator. Instead, he seeks a relationship with his creation. By, by nature, some people wait on relationships to come to them, and other people seek out relationships. That's true. Everybody in here, we're one of the two. We either, we either seek friends, seek companionship, seek romance, or we just wait and hope it comes to us. Some are seekers by nature. By nature, God is a seeker. Not only is God a seeker, he is a seeker of the lost, a seeker of sinners. In the Garden of Eden, God would visit daily with Adam and Eve. It was on one such visit, immediately following the newly wed couple leaving the forbidden fruit, that God had to actually search for them because then aware of their nakedness or their sinfulness, they had hidden from God. In his search, God called out, Where are you? God's called you that same way. I think Jesus actually says, Adam, where are you? But God has called out, Mike, where are you? He's called out, Joanna, where are you? Harry, where are you? Carol, where are you? He came seeking all of us, and he has called us by name. Where are you? Although the first couple attempted to hide from God, he sought them out. Not merely to punish them for their sin, but to redeem them from their sin. Every religion on the face of the earth, with the exception of Christianity, every religion can be understood as people attempting to seek God. Christianity, on the other hand, is best understood as God seeking people, seeking lost, hurting people. Speaking of himself, Jesus said, The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. I love the way the New Century verse translates this verse because it makes it clear exactly what, or I probably should say who, Jesus is seeking. This verse says, in the New Century version, it says, the Son of Man came to find lost people and save them. Lost people and save them. He didn't come looking for lost coins or even lost sheep. He came looking for you and for me, and he called our name. God cannot stop seeking the lost, the hurting, the downcast, the oppressed, because to do so would be denying who he is. As a seeking creator, God gives grace to those he seeks. Oh, don't ever forget about grace. Sometimes, sometimes we've been around the church long enough, we get a bunch of rules, we forget all about grace. Please, please, please keep the grace of God in the forefront of all you do and believe. God gives grace to those he's seeking. By their nature, some people are takers and others are givers. You've run across that, have you not? 
So I'm going to take anything you offer, they'll take it, and they'll take it forever. Others are givers. They give, and they give, and they give. By his nature, God is a giver. Not only is God a giver, he is the giver of good gifts. In the most well-known verse of the Bible, Jesus said, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God so loved that he gave. Don't let that phrase sink in. God so loved that he gave. And he did not merely give from his excess, like we typically do when we have our annual rubbing sale that had been postponed due to this thing virus. He didn't give of his excess. He didn't give what he no longer wanted. He didn't give what he no longer had use for. <coughs> Excuse me. Instead, he gave the very best that he had. He gave his only begotten son. Giving is perhaps the greatest testament to loving. And because the nature of God is love, as I said earlier, he gives grace. He gives grace to all who place their complete trust in the atoning work of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. The Apostle Paul put it this way in these familiar words. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. I could just see us now having a boasting convention. Yeah, I was so good, God just had to save me. I remember when I did this, and he saved me this because of that. Paul says we can't do that. Why? Because we're all sinners. Because we're all fall short of the grace of God. We all short of the glory of God. We do fall short of the grace of God. What Paul says in Romans, the glory of God. We're all sinners. We need grace. God cannot stop. Well, listen to me closely. I need to hear this. God cannot stop giving grace to the repentant because to do so would be denying who he is. As a creating, seeking, giving God, he is worthy of praise. In fact, God alone is worthy of our praise. In our culture, we tend to praise and idolize musicians, actors, athletes, coaches, even politicians, though that may be far away. We also have a tendency to celebrate wealth, beauty, and success with little regard for the character of the ones we are celebrating. So let me ask this. What is it about God's character that makes him legitimately praiseworthy. Legitimately praiseworthy. Well, let me suggest a few things, and as I brought it up. First of all, God is holy. Over and over again, the writers of the Bible, particularly the psalmist, declare the holiness of God. For example, Psalm 99 verse 5 says, Exalt the Lord our God, bow low before his feet, for he is holy. Speaking of followers of Jesus, when talking about us, the term holy means set apart. But when referring to God, the word holy means spiritually pure or sinless. Speaking of Jesus, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every aspect has been tested as we are, yet without I don't know about you, but I've failed more tests than I've passed. He passed every one without sin. God cannot be unholy. That is, God cannot sin because to do so would be denying who he is. Second, God is legitimately praiseworthy because he is righteous. Like his holiness, the Bible repeatedly mentions the righteous nature of God. For example, Psalm 48, 10 says, Like your name, O God, your praise reaches to the end of the earth. 
your right hand is filled with righteousness. Technically, the term righteousness means morally right. In reference to God, I prefer a simpler definition. Goodness in action. You know, we are called to be righteous. You do understand that, right? Goodness in action. With this in mind, listen to the message or how the, the message translates Psalm 4018. Your name, God, the boats of train of hallelujahs wherever you spoken near and far. Your arms are heaped with goodness in action. God cannot be unrighteous because to do so would be denying who he is. Though I could stand up here for hours sharing with you what it is about God's character that makes him legitimately praiseworthy, I will limit myself to one more. God is just. God is just. To be just is to be guided by truth, reason, and fairness. It's a combination of them all. To be guided by truth, reason, and fairness. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4, Moses told the Hebrew people that the Lord your God is a mighty defender, perfect and just in all of his ways. Your God is faithful and true. He does what is right and fair. God cannot treat anyone, even the vilest of sinners, even you and me. God cannot treat anyone unjustly because to do so would be denying who he is. Why is it important for us to know the nature and the character of God? Because we can, because before we can fully surrender our lives to Him, we need to know that He is truly trustworthy. Get that? I mean, just because somebody says something, we've been around long enough to know that isn't always the way it is, right? I mean, you do watch the commercials. I try not to. <laughs> uh, but they time it. You know that now? It don't matter what network you click to, it's commercial at the same time. They used to jump around. I can't do that anymore. But we need to know that God will do what God said He would do. We need to know that, that God is truly trustworthy. We need to know that He can deliver the salvation He promises. We need to know that He will never, no, never forsake us. We need to know that that he is more powerful than any obstacle, any trial, any tempt temptation, any battle, any pandemic, any social unrest we face. There is so much more about the character and nature of God that I have not talked about today that is just as important as the traits I have mentioned. But I don't have the time to draw a box that big. Well, I probably have the time to you stay and try to draw a box that big. I didn't, for example, I didn't talk about God being sovereign. I didn't talk about Him being a healer or a deliverer or a provider or a caregiver. The list is endless. But I do want to briefly mention one more thing. God is the Savior of all who put their complete trust in the saving work of Christ across the cross. God is the Savior of all who put their complete trust in the saving work of Jesus on the cross of God. In His sovereignty, God has predetermined or predestined Himself to save all who place their complete trust in Him. To do anything less than this would be denying who He is. Notice that I said complete trust and not verbal assent. Placing our complete trust in Christ requires our total surrender to Jesus as our Lord. And when we do that, it produces a new us. An us that gradually conforms to the image of Christ. Complete trust creates within us a new creation. 
uh, verbal assent that Jesus is, is Christ requires only mental agreement and produces no significant lasting change in either our words or our deeds. Did you catch me? Here in our country, here in the South, particularly the rest of that portion we call the Bible Belt, we have pew after pew filled with people, and I'm not trying to talk about anybody in this room, I make no individual judgments. We have pew after pew after pew of people who have given mental assent that Jesus is the Christ, but they've never surrendered their life to him. They've never trusted him. Boy, they may call out in a crisis. But when the crisis is over, they're back to their own selves. They've never trusted him. Not even enough to tithe, much less to trust him in a tough situation. You see, mental sin produces no significant lasting change. Complete trust in Christ makes us Christ like. By the way, that's God's goal for us. Complete trust in Christ makes us Christ-like. Mental agreement makes us religious. And simply being religious leads us outside the kingdom of God. Don't believe it? Read the New Testament. See where the Pharisees and Sadducees stood primarily. The most religious people in the history of the world. Outside. In closing, I want to share you the words of Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 8, where the Apostle Paul wrote these words. It wasn't so long ago that we ourselves were stupid and stubborn. Now, don't take offense. Is he talking to me here? If don't reply to you, let it slide over. It wasn't so long ago that we ourselves were stupid and stubborn, dupes of sin, ordered every which way by our glands, going around with a chip on our shoulder, hated and hating back. But when God, our kind and loving Savior God, stepped in, He saved us from all that. It was all His doing. We had nothing to do with it. He gave us a good bath. We came out of it new people. Washed inside and out by the Holy Spirit. Our Savior Jesus poured out new life so generously. God's gift has restored our relationship with Him and given us back our lives. And there's more life to come. An eternity of life. And then Paul closes to this simple phrase. You can count on this. You can count on this. We can depend on God to be our Savior when we surrender our lives to Christ. We can count on it because for God to do anything else would be denying who He is. And God simply cannot do that. Let us pray that. Lord, we come before you ever thankful that you are true to yourself, that you're true to your word, that what you tell us never fails. Help us to trust you. Help us to trust you in the difficulties of life. Help us to trust you in our own personal struggles, whether they be mental or emotional or physical or spiritual or financial or relational. Help, you, help us to trust you in the large things of life like pandemics and racial unrest and economic downturns. Help us to trust you because we know that what you said is true. Help us not only to say that but to live it. To step out in complete faith and total surrender. In your holy name I do pray. Amen. Now if you'll stand and take your hymnals, turn to 581. Verses 1, 2, 4 of Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus.
Thank you for being here this day. I pray that God has blessed you in some way or another. And if you happen to went to sleep and missed part of it, Wednesday afternoon, sometime it should be available on YouTube or our website for you to go back. And the neat thing about that is you can fast forward to me. <laughs> Mute me, whatever you want to do. With all that said, receive now this benediction. Believe in the risen Jesus. And live accordingly by placing your complete trust in him. Not only inside these walls, not only at home, but out in the world. Your holy name, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. That be dismissed from the rear before it comes up.